Divine justice will give way to divine chastisements, including what some seers say are three days of darkness. Join us now as we continue to break down our timeline on Countdown to the Kingdom. Hello, I'm Mark Mallett from the NowWord.com and CountdownToTheKingdom.com. Well, to discuss these rather serious and sobering topics is Professor Daniel O'Connor from Albany, New York. Daniel, welcome back to the show. Hello, Mark. Good to be here. You had a little time off. I hope you enjoyed your vacation. Oh, I did. I was floating in lakes up here in Canada um, and I made sure my ears were underwater. The phone was turned off. And no, it was wonderful. I really needed that time away because... Yeah. Uh, I, I know that your phone that your phone was turned off. You weren't treated to our uh, our usual barrage of uh, uh, feedback. Then were you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, the interesting feedback. Yeah, we were, we were discussing before the show the interesting feedback we've had of uh, you know because some of the videos now are, are well over a hundred thousand on their way to two hundred thousand views, which we never you never know what you're going to get with uh, with these videos. But we we have gotten comments from people. We don't mind your comments at all. We're, we're, we're saying this in jest. But, I mean, those are serious things. People actually did write and say those things. Yeah, that, that was not made up. We have gotten all of that and much more <laughs> and much more. We won't we won't turn on about about the rest, but there's plenty more. Yeah, so, thank you all for that. You know, we don't mind it. I, I mean, I guess I, should, I don't mind it. I don't think Mark minds it either. No. You can, uh, you, you, that doesn't bother us at all. But, you know, some things do kind of irk us a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> none of that stuff. But, um you know, moving into something serious here is that it is the scoffers, you know, you know, throw as much mud as you want at me. I, I won't speak for Mark, throw as much mud as you want at me. I deserve it. I'm a sinner. I'm not bring it on. I, I, I deserve it. But, you know, you better be careful if you're going to go attacking heaven itself, as so many of these mainstream Catholic voices in establishment mm -hmm. uh, Catholic circles are, are jumping on today. Just this flippant denial and rejection of the entire prophetic consensus. And it, this has been spoken of in Scripture as well. You know, to look at 2 Peter. Uh, Peter wrote, You should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand, in the last scoffers will come, in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? All these voices today saying, how dare you, you even suggest that we might be near the end times? How dare you quote heaven's messages as indicating that? People have thought that before and been wrong. Peter in Scripture is condemning that that attitude. That's what that's what the scoffers are saying today. Yeah, and we aren't. You know, we're not. You know, we we, we would maybe I would even agree with people who are saying this. If Daniel, you and I were sitting here giving our opinion on these things, right? But you and I, for the last what eight webcasts, nine webcasts, have been quoting popes who've been speaking. I mean, I've got a list of popes. Was it nine, ten, twelve popes, including the recent pope, who are speaking about the times we are saying that signs of the end are emerging? John Paul II saying the final confrontation is now upon us and we're facing it. Pope Benedict quoting the Book of Revelation and relating it to our times several times. Pope Francis referred twice to a book on the Antichrist, recommending people read it. Uh, you got Pius X saying that the Antichrist may already be on earth. Leo XIII saying that the sin of iniquity, that sin of lawlessness is, is abounding, where we're denying the truth and that the, you know, on and on. And these popes are saying, yeah. they've been the warning. The popes are shouting. They're they're shouting. They've been warning. They've been shouting. As, as you wrote so well in that post, why aren't the popes shouting? Well, the moral yeah. story is they are and we're not listening. We're not listening to the popes we're not listening to heaven and yet you try to give heaven a voice and you're condemned as a doom and gloom apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic person and you know one commentator i don't want to name any names here but one commentator accused us of giving grand prophecies with details that are troubling saying that we lack wisdom for for uh creating this so-called orthodoxy of apocalypticism out of private revelation suggesting that the end times are upon us saying that we are devout but naive Catholics, as if this is coming from us. It's not. 
You know, that reminds me of a quote um, on our website, Daniel. Uh, I'd love to look it up, you know, uh, while we're getting ready for this, because I don't have it in front of me. But, you know, I'm just thinking of, um, I'll just summarize it from Michael D. O'Brien, who said, you know, if we if we don't have this discussion of the apocalyptic See, I can't, see, I'm having a stroke. <laughs> Don't have a stroke, sir. I actually am having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> if we leave this discussion of the apocalyptic elements of our time to those who are given to terror or who are subjective, who don't follow the church fathers, don't follow the papacy. And I don't, you know, I love our evangelical brothers and sisters, but many of them have the details wrong. They're promoting things like the rapture, which is which is nonsense. I'm sorry, it's, you know, not a rapture, a pre-tribulation rapture is nonsense. A rapture at the very end of the world is biblical. But, you know, these kinds of things are what what's going on right now in, in the realm of, of of um, the world and in in the in the speak that's going on in the internet in forums and chat rooms, and you know honestly, Daniel and I I say it with love, but I wish it was our bishops, mm-hmm. who are the ones who are coming forth and they were sitting here talking. Now I, you know I praised many. There are some priests out there like Father Mark Goring and other priests who are really trying hard to 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 not hide from these issues and to face them front. On and I, I thank them for that for trying to be good shepherds who don't Amen. ignore, you know what comprises a good portion of the Gospels, of the Pauline letters, of the the epistles of Saint Peter and so on. the The idea of the anticipation of Christ and the end times was a theme that was rich in those times. The anticipation of it, the, you know, speaking about de- divine chastisement, warning people to prepare for the coming of the day of the Lord like a thief in the night. I mean, this was prominent in the writings of Scripture, but in our generation, oh, we don't talk about these things. And you know, Daniel and I are. We don't. No, why would we talk about those things? We've got committees. You know, we've we've got plans. We've got, you know, we've got we've got our 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 parish restructuring plans to worry about. You know, what the what the mainstream voices in the church are doing today is, they're arranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Which is all this minutia that they're obsessed yeah. with, that they that they think private revelation is a distraction from. And we're saying, forget about the deck chairs. Here's a lifeboat. Get let's get in the lifeboats, because the Titanic is going down. And what is the lifeboat? The lifeboat is the sacred heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Those are your only refuge. That that is your only refuge in what's coming. Because all of those safe structures that you have been depending upon thus far. They're going down, and we're just being honest about that. Mm-hmm. And look, if yeah, you want to call that doom and gloom on, on the seals, sorry, Daniel, I was going to yeah. say our, our previous webcast on the seven seals, all we did was not only cite the, the prophetic words of seers, which is one thing, but we then accompanied that with, with um, headlines of what's going on in the world. Right. You know, you don't have to be a prophet today. You just have to be able to read the news. Yeah, you just need two eyes. To be able to see and. and or, or one eye, or, or no eye. You just yeah. you just need an ounce of honesty, and you'll realize what's happening. But it, but we still have these these voices condemning us as doom and gloom, apocalyptic, end times fanatics. Well, these are the academics doing it, right? Oh yeah, it's it's this incessant drive to be cool in the eyes of the establishment. And and I say this, you know, uh, there's a great quote, Peter Kraft, from Peter Kraft. Um, mm-hmm. What is the? It was a question. What is the one qualification? to believe the most idiotic ideas that have ever been invented in the history of man. And that one qualification is, you guessed it, a PhD. (laughs) And I say this as one working on a PhD myself. So I I know how it works today in that that whole industry, because that's what it is. It's all about trying to look cool in the eyes of the mainstream establishment who, you know, run the fancy conferences and run the elite universities that have sold their souls to the devil. And in the secular world, what you do, what a PhD does to try to be cool is, you know, like call two plus two equals four white privilege or something like that. But right. in the Catholic world, uh, what you, what you one of the greatest things you can do to be cool as, a, as an academic in the eyes of the establishment is to poo-poo private revelation. You know, that's stuff for overly pious old ladies, maybe. Right. Which, of course, that, I mean, that's borderline blasphemy. 
saying that about heaven's messages. Yes, there are some object objectively fearful things coming, but every seer we have on Countdown of the Kingdom, and, and, and we only have a small sampling of the authentic seers out there, all of them are embedding this brutal honesty about what's coming mm -hmm. in an overarching message of hope and trust and joy and even excitement. So if you look at these messages and you say, oh, that doesn't give me peace, so I, I can't be anywhere near it. You're saying something about yourself more than more than about these seers. You're right. saying that you don't trust Jesus enough. And if you don't trust Jesus enough, don't blame that on the seers today. Because Jesus himself, when he was asked about the end times, about the signs of the end of the age and the end of the world, he broke away from parables, broke away from storytelling, and he was not remiss to tell them everything he just suddenly said oh right. well what's coming nation will rise against nation kingdom against kingdom earthquakes famines plagues right. um persecutions you know the abomination so uh, jesus wasn't afraid to talk about these things and so obviously he knew that we needed to hear them in fact he even said right. that remember when I've t these things begin to happen you remember that i told you that is then you can't, you won't freak out because I, I warned you and I told yeah. you, and I expected yeah, but Mark, you to if, be prepared. If, if if the voices we have in the church today were alive then and listening to our Lord in the Olivet discourse, they would have said, "Oh no, this is, this yes. this, this isn't making me happy. This isn't giving no. me good fuzzy feelings. I'm gonna forget about this. You know, this is false. This is this is inauthentic. Jesus I'm gonna go is doom and gloom. Yeah, geez, doom and gloom. I'm gonna go listen to Joel Osteen. He's he's giving me peace. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. If, if that's your approach. Approach, just don't pretend that you're actually discerning. You've completely subjectivized it, and you're not going by the church-sanctioned norms of discernment, which we always and, strive to submit to at Countdown to the King. Amen. Pope Benedict, uh, Emeritus Pope Benedict, formerly Cardinal Ratzinger, was asked at that time, why are you such a pessimist? And he looked at the person and he said, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. And part of the reality of what is coming in the world right now is that we are heading toward a day of divine justice. And this was given to St. Faustina by, by uh, uh, our Lord to her directly. He said, determined is the day of justice, the day of divine wrath. The angels tremble before it. Speak to souls about this great mercy while it is still time for granting mercy, which is what we're in right now, which is why we're doing this webcast. We're in a time of mercy, and so Jesus says, Let all men recognize my unfathomable mercy. It is a sign for the end times, and after it will come the day of justice. So what we are doing right now is we are picking up on our timeline at countdowntothekingdom.com and you can see on the left of this great storm, which is an analogy of what is coming and has already begun, I believe, on the earth, the seven seals of revelation that deal with economic and social collapse and many of the things we're seeing in the headlines today, followed by the warning in a time of repentance God is going to grant. The day of mercy is what he called he said to St. Faustina, I think that's a fair application of that prophecy. Then comes the day of the Lord, the day of justice. And we're going to talk about in the Era of Peace webcast, which will be after this one. We're ex pretty excited about that one. Uh, we're going to talk about what the day of the Lord means more. But right now, we are focusing on the period of divine chastisements, which involve the reign of Antichrist and that culminate in the three days of darkness. And this is different in kind from our earlier webcast on the seals. Mm -hmm. We talked about the seals as mankind basically reaping what he's sown, mm -hmm. what man reaping what he has sown, because it's kind of like God saying, you made your bed, now sleep in it. We've brought these things directly upon ourselves with the wars and the famines and the economic and social collapse and so on and so forth. But that's not all there is to it. It's not just about God saying, you made your bed, now sleep in it. There's also divine justice. Yes, God is our Father. And what does any good Father do? He punishes. He does. Don't believe anyone who says that God does not punish, even if that person's address happens to be somewhere in the Vatican City State. God punishes. You know, most of my generation grew up without that. I'm, I'm a millennial. Most of my generation grew up with no punishment. So, and, and what's the fruits of that? The fruits of that is an entire generation that is completely depressed and anxious and suicidal because we were never stopped in the evil path we were walking on by good, proper punishment. Spare the rod, spoil the child, it says in exactly. the Bible. 
And uh, I mean, we're not advocating here, of course, beating your children or something stupid like that um, and sinful. But what we're talking about is Hebrews chapter 12. What father who loves his child does not discipline him? But ultimately, when we are talking about these divine chastisements, we, chastisements, we are also speaking about a purification where God is saying, I have to step in and as a father intervene because humanity has reached a point where it's rebellion, you will destroy yourselves. And so I believe in even in these chastisements, Daniel, God is going to, you know, try and bring as many people home exactly. to himself as he can. But there, there with a purpose, yeah. There is going to be a, a certain sifting. If we're talking about the Antichrist, you're, you know, we definitely know in sacred tradition, St. John writes about people being marked by this beast, by this Antichrist. So, you know, you have to understand there's going to become, as part of this end time period after the eye of the storm, there's going to be a sifting where people are going to choose their camps, as uh, Bishop Sheen would say, you know, the people are being divided into two camps, and boy, are they ever today. The divisions that we're seeing right now are all signs of what is coming, of the separation where we there's no more sitting on the fence, as we said in the previous webcast. You have to choose. And after we've chosen, there will come a point where God will say, enough. And Blessed Anne, Anna Mary Tige said, God will send two punishments. One will be in the form of wars, revolutions, and other evils. And frankly, that's what we talked about in the seven seals. Right. That these are man-made things. That everything, you know, the persecution, the social collapse, peace being shattered, war, economic collapse. This is man reaping what he's sowing. But then she says, the other punishment will be sent from heaven and that's what we're focusing on now in this show is the divine chastisements that are going to result in the purification of the world in an era of peace yes these are punishments yes but they're punishments with a purpose they are not just god getting ticked off and deciding he needs to punish no he has a plan in mind with them and that's probably the most important thing to keep in mind from this webcast is all these divine chastisements we're going to talk about especially the three days of darkness they prove that god is at work restoring the world purifying the world creating a new world a collapsing building as jesus tells the servant of god louis spicaretta must be torn down in order for a more in order for a more beautiful one to be built on the very ruins themselves so he is up to something here the three days of darkness especially that is universally prophesied in private revelation it's part of the prophetic consensus it's going to happen and it proves with its violence and universality that god is building a new world through it and after it but you, you know one more quick point on this idea of god punishing because i think that some people are still going to be hung up on this they're still going right. to have a few homilies they heard in the back of their mind maybe where they heard the the pastor say no god never punishes that's an old testament idea right. we're christians now uh that's a heresy that's that called is. the marcionite heresy it is a formally condemned heresy of the church the marcionite heresy says that the God revealed by the Old Testament is actually different in nature from the God revealed by the New Testament. That the Old Testament revealed a God of wrath, and the New Testament reveals a God of compassion. That is a heresy. Look it up if you don't believe me. It's called Marcionism. And it sounds so familiar to you because you've all heard it before in articles or homilies or blog posts or whatever. It is a lie. God never changes. It is a, one of the highest dogmas of the faith, is God's absolute immutability. The same God mm -hmm. that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, the same God that destroyed the whole world with the flood, is the God you worship in the Eucharist, is the God that became incarnate in Jesus Christ, is the God that reigns over the church today. Same exact God. Is the God who hasn't said, changed. let the little children come to me. Yes, so, it's all the same God. Those are not con His God. justice and His mercy yeah. are not contradictions. They're always in perfect balance, as we've said before. You know, I can't forget either. Ironically, it's the people today who are who pr I think propose that kind of idea that oh, God is love. You know, who are the ones who, in their political correctness, are the most. You know, they display this most vociferous spirit of justice whenever they mm -hmm. see something that they think is unjust and right. they're ready to pounce on people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe they could stop and just reflect on, on themselves and say, you know what, <laughs> if I'm so just, maybe that, and I'm made in God's image, maybe there's mm -hmm. something to the fact that God is just. But 
God's justice is so different than ours. He, you know, so we, much above ours. We yes. act out of vengeance. We act out of anger. You know, kind of a a reaction and emotion. But God's justice is one where the the scales are no. This this is the balance that must be, and I am the creator right. of the universe. Let's not Perfect forget balance. that. Perfect balance. He's the creator of the universe. It is within God's divine right to give life and to take life. And if it suits God's purposes to take a third of the population of the earth through chastisement, then it's God's purposes. And what happens to that one third who are taken? Well, that's between them and God. And who knows right. what happens right. in the We don't despair second. of their salvation, of that's course. Right. We always hope and pray for everyone's salvation. Not that all are saved. We know that's not true. But we never make assumptions about who is and is not. So we never, yeah. you know, whoever is going to be killed in the upcoming divine chastisements, do not assume they're damned. You pray for everyone. Always assume that everyone who dies goes to purgatory. Unless you know they're a martyr or canonized or something. Or right. just always assume they need your prayers and pray for them. That's for another webcast, maybe. But yes, this, these chastisements, th this divine balance, it, it, we can simply look around the world today and we can realize why God as perfect balance, which he is, he's always perfectly balanced, we can realize that it is theologically impossible for there to not be divine chastisement. It is right. theologically impossible. If you realize that Marcionism is a heresy, if you realize that God never changes, if you realize that the God who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah is the same God that exists today, you will realize that there absolutely positively must be impending divine chastisements. I'm sorry, but there's no other possible conclusion to arrive at. Mm -hmm. Shall we discuss why that's so? <laughs> Are there any other quotes you want to share first? Well, the only thing I'm going to say to Sip before we get into the real nitty gritties of this, and and again, Daniel and I, we don't. There's not a single bone in us that takes pleasure in the idea that this might scare or or frighten people. But again, you know, I think of uh, what Saint John said: "Perfect love casts out all fear, because fear," he said, "has to do with judgment." If we're afraid of these things, if we're afraid of what God might bring upon the earth, that says to me that we're not perfect in love. And so the answer to this, the answer to this webcast and to anything that Daniel and I might say that maybe makes you uncomfortable or shakes you, is to go into prayer, is to, to draw near to Him who is love, to draw near to God who, is, who indeed is love, but He's also justice, but He is love and He is mercy. And to get to know Christ, to pray, to right. draw near to the sacraments, to go to confession, to let Him forgive you. And in that relationship, the personal relationship with Christ, that melts away fear to the point, and you have to detach from this world, detach from your things. You know, remember the sad one, the sad rich man who left Jesus. He was sad because in following Christ, he felt this was going to be, an, you know, he's going to lose everything. So there was fear. And I tell you, a lot of people are afraid about what's coming in the world because they don't want to lose their cabin and their boat and the brand new car right. they just saved up for. Exactly. So and he's offering you so much more than all of that garbage. That's right. But, you have nothing to be afraid of. Yes, these, as we always say, these are objectively <laughs> fearsome things we're talking yeah. about, but you dear soul, mm -hmm. striving to be a friend of Christ, trying. There's no difference between doing God's will and trying to do God's will. Those are the same thing. <laughs> because if you're sincerely trying to do God's will, you are doing His will, because He can't expect more than the sincere, wholehearted attempt. You have nothing to be afraid of if you're trying to be in that right. boat, in that ark. So well, don't be afraid about what we're about to tell you. If yeah. that's who you, if, if you're not trying, if you don't care, if you're flippantly living a life of sin, then yeah, you should have a little holy fear to inspire you to get in the ark of the Immaculate Heart and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So with that being said... In defense, with, with, yeah. before you go on with that, in defense of God the Father, uh, he said to Louisa Picaretta, Jesus, my justice can bear no more. My will wants to triumph and would want to triumph by means of love in order to establish its kingdom. But man does not want to come to meet this love Therefore, it is necessary to use justice. So he I just want everything. sorry to interrupt you, Daniel, exactly. but I, no, please I do. just wanted to say that because that's the heart of Christ. He even said right. that to St. Faustina. In the Old Testament, I sent prophets wielding thunderbolts, but now I send you with my love and my mercy. He said, and my love and my mercy is clamoring to be spent, but souls just do not want to take advantage of my mercy. And so here we are now. 
about to discuss mm. what is left, and that is God's justice. And yeah. let's begin why and what would bring God's justice down upon the earth. I, yeah, the, and, and we know from Scripture what does. And, you know, before I say that, though, I'll just thank you for interrupting me. Please do any time, because I'm so glad you brought that up, because I meant to and forgot that Jesus is repeatedly telling the servant of God, Louis Picaretz, and many other seers that this is an absolute last resort. And you can't say that he didn't try anything, everything else first. Chastisements are an absolute last resort to save his beloved children from the fires of hell. It is, it is justice, but it is justice motivated from pure love. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we should not be afraid of what's coming. I'm not sweating because I'm afraid. I'm sweating because there's a heat wave now in Albany and it's almost 100 degrees and I have no air conditioning in my office. So I'm sweating like a pig right now and I apologize. And I'm you in can send me building an igloo, so <laughs> I don't understand what you're going <laughs> Yeah, you can send me hate mail for sweating after the, uh, uh, I deserve it. But anyway, so there are, we know from scripture, this is not Mark, this is not speculation from Mark right. and I. This actually isn't even just a private revelation. This is a scriptural revelation. It's also sacred, confirmed by sacred tradition that there are four sins, especially, that cry out to God for vengeance. These are the four sins we know from Scripture, that when they become widespread, when they become uh, frequently committed, God's justice will fall down. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is just a matter of time. It, it can't not. 